Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So I, I first met Ian many years ago uh, when he was trying to sell me a, a story. The story he was trying to sell me then was Parallel Prologue. Goes back some years, Ian, right? <laughs> and then I think it was uh, Fortran M, I think it was, which was the formal methods in Fortran, a complicated mix of things. Uh, and Ian has done many things, and the latest thing he's been doing is looking at infrastructure for collaboration and grid middleware and things like that. But he has many more things uh, uh, to his expertise, and he's always been involved in more projects than I could believe possible. And so I'm sure Ian's going to tell us some of the things he's learned, and, and this certainly chimes very much uh, his topic today with what we're trying to do in, uh, in external research with the scientific community. So Ian, delighted to have you in Redmond. Okay, uh, do I need to hold my hand? <laughs> okay. yeah, I, I met Tony when he was at Southampton and he uh, tried to recruit me there arguing that my mother-in-law lived just across the Solent and that would be a positive reason. <laughs> he, he didn't know my mother-in-law. So. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, uh, I'm, uh, what I want to do is talk to you about some you know, ideas we're pursuing at the University of Chicago and Argonne. Uh, in the context of the Computation Institute. So this is something I took on a couple of years ago, running the Computation Institute. Uh, I think I have a slide about it. Uh, and you know, uh, the, the goal is to f further uh, investigations of uh, challenging uh, problems in the sciences, uh, often system level uh, problems that you know, require uh, the integration of expertise from many different disciplines. Uh, we have about uh, 100 fellows, uh, 60 staff, uh, and a fair range of projects. And, and one of the uh, things that this uh, work has led me to, to, to do is to become increasingly interested in the problems of, of uh, how we accelerate the data analysis process, the research process, and, and uh, you know, the tools that we might need to, to achieve that. So I'll start off with a little historical uh, uh, slide just to remind us how w life used to be back in the 1600s. If we were interested in something like the structure of the, uh, the universe, we would go through a fairly simple uh, process by which we uh, you know, got some money, built an observatory. This is Tycho Brahe, by the way. Uh, then uh, you know, we'd recruit a, a young uh, upcoming fellow like Kepler. He'd analyze our data and eventually uh, learn something of interest. Um, along the way, he might, uh, some say, uh, poison uh, his advisor uh, in order to get access to the data. So even back then, access to data was a challenge. But clearly, you know, the amount of data that way people were dealing with back then was not a tremendous uh, problem. So if we you know, fast forward uh, 400 years and see how things have changed, um, so clearly automation of the data collection processes resulted in probably nine orders of magnitude increase in data rates. Uh, the amount of data that we have access to us, access to just in astronomy is around about a petabyte uh, this year or next year. Uh, a major change, of course, is that no the number of investigators has changed dramatically from around about one uh, back in 1600 uh, to uh, certainly tens of thousands. Nowadays in astronomy and maybe a million or more if you count amateur, uh, astronomies, the computational speeds, the amount of literature, things are very different. Um, and of course, this results in new problems uh, for the investigator. So uh, if we look at another field that uh, is, is also of interest, biomedical research. So about the same time, if you wanted to uh, perform some research, your main problem was finding a body to uh, cut up, uh, which was quite a challenge back then. Uh, but nowadays, of course, things have similarly changed in a dramatic way. This is a slide put together by John Woolley, who uh, tries to quantify you know, the number of entities, not the amount of data, but just the number of entities that one needs to, to deal with if one is investigating uh, either biomedical research or, or basic healthcare uh, research. And these, the associated 
numbers, of course, uh, are, are, are changing on, on, on very dramatic uh, exponentials. Mm -hmm. And in every field from astronomy to, uh, to biomedicine, we see uh, people struggling with the fact that what used to fit on, in their notebook, then on their floppy disk, uh, then on their uh, hard drive, no longer seems quite uh, so easy to deal with. So the next slide is a cultural reference that you may, actually no, there's, that's this, the slide after is a cultural reference. Here, here's, a, here's a slide that uh, quantifies one effect of that. So this is there's a log plot on the y-axis. It's the number of gene sequences that have been collected in the last uh, uh, decade or so. Um, and then the blue uh, line is the number of annotations. Uh, for example, annotations asserting knowledge or, or belief about uh, the, the function of, of particular genes. And you can see that's increasing far less rapidly. And that is, that is a sign that people aren't be able to keep up with the amount of data that's being produced in ter terms of the analysis that's being performed. So this is the slide of the subtle cultural reference. Uh, does anyone recognize this? Uh, the Black Knight from uh, uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. You know, he uh, is uh, saying, it's just a flesh wound. Um, he's had his, uh, and of course many scientists will simply say, we just need a bigger disk and a, and a workstation and, and we'll be okay. But I think increasingly people are realizing that that is no longer the case. So. Instead, uh, you know, what I, I, I believe we, we see a need for is something we might call an open analytics environment. So let me explain what that is. And I've adopted a, a cooking metaphor for some reason. Um, that's a supercomputer down the bottom. Uh, what is an open analytics environment? This is something into which many people, certainly individual investigators, but teams also can pour their data, whether uh, scientific measurements, uh, uh, information about the network structure of, of uh, their data or their, or their domain, uh, the scientific literature, we'll come back to that in a second, uh, into which we can then also uh, you know, you know, pour uh, programs, service definitions, uh, stored procedures and rules, uh, and out of which we can then uh, extract uh, results. And we'll look at in a bit more detail on what some each is involved in each of these steps in a second. Um, and we want this... Uh, environment to have at least virtually the property that uh, we no longer think of what we can do with our data in terms of what is possible on a single computer, but think at least ideally in terms of you know, if we had unlimited storage, unlimited computing, if we weren't constrained by the, the fact that different pieces of data are in different formats, if we didn't have to worry about the fact that the analysis routine we got from our uh, friend is uh, written uh, for MATLAB and we're running on a platform that doesn't support it, uh, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and also if these tools supported all of the collaborative processes uh, that uh, really make part of the scientific uh, problem-solving process, we could version things, we could document their provenance, we could collaborate with others in, in analyzing them, we could annotate them with arbitrary annotations. Uh, if we had such a system, which is very far from what most researchers have available to, to them today, I think we could really uh, transform the way that research happens in, in, a, in a wide variety of fields. So let's look at, uh, oh, first of all, uh, I know the word open is sometimes uh, one that isn't popular here at Microsoft, so I thought I'd put up, a, I got a dictionary out to see uh, what it meant. And of course it doesn't, it means many things besides uh, the ones that Richard Stallman uh, likes to, uh, I guess he doesn't use open, he uses other things, but you know, having the interior immediately accessible, generous, liberal, or, or bounteous, um, and then not constipated is the, the one I, I like the best. Okay, so what goes in? Um, so uh, I'll talk about some of the applications that we're working with, and I'm sure you've got your own uh, uh, applications that you're familiar with, at least some of you, but you know, there's, as I indicated before, um, you know, scientific data, which comes in many uh, different forms. Uh, um, image, you know, text, uh, tabular data, image data, this is uh, functional MRI data. Uh, in the biological sciences, of course, we've got uh, many, many instruments, each of which is capable of generating data at extremely high rates. Um, uh, network data, the scientific literature, um, there's a few others there, I'm sure, uh, different instrument data. Uh, clinical data, in the case of the biomedical sciences, uh, if you're a, po a political scientist, uh, online news feeds. Uh, these are all things that, uh, if we can put them in 
to a common place uh, will allow us to uh, pursue interesting uh, connections, and we'll mention some of those connections in, in a second. Uh, we want to be able to then establish and assert uh, connections between things and, and tag uh, data with uh, hypotheses, um, you know, putative connections, perhaps uh, putative uh, uh, you know, beliefs regarding uh, the reliability of the data uh, or, the, uh, or its, or its, uh, or its uh, meaning. Um, we also then want to be able to throw in uh, programs. And uh, you know, programs can be uh, workflows. This is a Taverna workflow. Uh, they can be parallel programs. This is a Swift uh, program, um, a system that uh, developed at Chicago by uh, Yong Zhao, uh, one of your uh, staff uh, here when he was a PhD student there. Uh, or rules, you know, perhaps, uh, or, or installed procedures. Uh, you know, programs written things like, using things like MapReduce or Dryad, uh, SQL uh, procedures, uh, etc., uh, etc. Programs written in, in many different uh, uh, programming uh, notations. Uh, optimization uh, m m methods and, and so on and, and so forth. Um, and of course, ideally, we want to be able to associate these with programs. So when data comes in, it can easily be uh, operated on by uh, any of these uh, procedures and transformed into a form that may then be operated on by uh, some other uh, procedure. It's, it's, a, it's amazing to see the tremendous enthusiasm that MapReduce, which purpur purports to do that, for a very simple class of problems is generated even, I mean, it's almost laughingly, laughingly s simple, but pe people see it as a somewhat liberating tool for data analysis. Uh, and then I couldn't think of how to illustrate this part of it with beautiful pictures, so let's just talk. Um, you know, what do we want to do to make this happen? We need to be able to run any program, store any data um, without regard for format, um, without regard for uh, issues of scaling. And of course, scaling issues always arise in practice, but we do want to be able to operate on terabytes and perhaps petabytes of data and perform computations that involve you know, the comparison of many elements within different terabyte and, and even petabyte data sets. So that means substantial scale. Um, it also means uh, the ability to uh, do away with the platform dis dis uh, differences uh, that currently um, hinder so much uh, into operation. So you know, the, the tremendous uh, uh, popularity of platforms like Amazon EC2 clearly have something to tell us there. Uh, there should be built-in indexing so we can keep track of what's in there and uh, what can operate uh, and what. And then under, under the cover provisioning mechanism so that we can allocate resources to these different uh, potentially very large demands uh, fairly easily. And then what comes out so I was particularly proud of this graphic. Uh, so what I'm trying to illustrate here, though, is that as data comes out of this thing, we should be able to, you know, it'll be rich data that has a, a, a provenance information associated with it. So, you know, this data was generated by this uh, Taverna workflow. One of its inputs was this uh, uh, network that came from somewhere else, and maybe these are the, uh, you know, the people that uh, have expressed some opinions on the validity uh, of that workflow. Um, you know, and over here we've got a, a parallel computation that generated this piece of data that operated on this uh, MRI data using an algorithm described in this uh, piece of the scientific literature. Um, okay, I think you uh, get the picture. Okay, so, and then finally, um, you know, I think that this, the notion that analysis is not just a one-off procedure, it's a process. We need to take that into, bear that in mind. Um, you know, as we over time, we add data, we transform it, we annotate it, we search for it, we add to it, we tag it, uh, uh, we may visualize it, others may come in and discover it, uh, extend it, we may group things together in different ways, uh, we may share it or, or not with, with others. Uh, these are things that need to be supported in this sort of environment. Okay, so I guess I'll skip this slide. Just to, um, yeah, the, so, so far I've talked in a very abstract sense. So uh, when, and an obvious question that might, you might ask is, was this some huge uh, central, um, what's the word uh, nowadays, a cloud? Um, uh, or is it some distributed environment that links uh, many different uh, sub-clouds, if you like? Well, I think the answer has got to be both. Um, many of the algorithms that we need to be able to uh, 
execute require strong locality of reference and so have to be performed on data that's centrally lo located, but ultimately data will uh, end up being uh, distributed and to, m to, m to match those two worlds, things need to be able to move from one place uh, to another. Okay, so now I want to talk a bit about some of the things that uh, we're doing at Chicago uh, in, a, in a, an effort to uh, you know, realize some of these capabilities. And of course we realize that this is a, a vast uh, uh, endeavor and we're not going to be able to undertake it by ourselves and that's one of the reasons why I was interested in coming out and visiting here. So first of all here, here's a, a list of some of the applications that we're working with. Uh, there are quite a few others, um, but these are all areas in which we have particular expertise either at the university or at the Argonne National Lab. Um, astrophysics, uh, so this is a, uh, an exploding uh, type, 2-1A, type 1A supernova. Um, so the using supercomputer super simulations a group at Chicago has shown for the, a uh, putative mechanism that seems uh, for the first time believable in, in explaining why supernova happen. Uh, this is, turns out to be a data problem because what they produce is tens of terabytes of data that then needs to be made available to the community and compared with uh, observational data. Uh, so it becomes a data resource. Uh, cognitive science, uh, huge amounts of work on different aspects of MRI, uh, studies, for example. East Asian studies, uh, you might not have thought of that as being data intensive, but it turns out uh, this group uh, has been uh, going to China and taking extensive photographic surveys uh, of uh, various uh, temples. And thanks to help from uh, Savas Parastidis, we've had the Photosynth group helping them to uh, visualize some of their data. Uh, economics uh, is, a, in my view, a discipline that is about to explode as a consumer and producer of data. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, but this is a, a, a fairly detailed map of uh, occupational choice and wealth uh, in, uh, in Thailand, um, something that turns out to be of great interest computationally. Environmental science, of course, is familiar uh, to us. Epidemiology also, genomic medicine. Uh, we are doing a lot of work in that area, although I won't say too much about it here. Uh, neuroscience, so this is a, a little uh, a moldy uh, chip uh, thing you can stick in typically a monkey's brain but you could stick it in your own if you wanted and uh, get uh, large amounts of data. Uh, political science, um, so uh, I have a friend at Google New York and thanks to him we, we're getting a, a, a feed of about uh, two million online news articles a day and sticking them into a, into a, a database uh, and uh, then performing data intensive analyses uh, on that uh, database to look at things like uh, political slant uh, in, uh, in uh, newspaper reporting. Uh, so sociology, solid state physics, and so on and so forth. So there's a huge number of people, each of which has got their own data intensive science uh, to perform, each of which is currently limited in their ability to perform that science. So for example, these guys, um, they performed what was the world's largest turbulence simulation last year took them a week, 11 million CPU hours, then took them, uh, I think, three weeks to move the data back to Chicago and about three or four months to perform the analysis because of the limitations of the tools they have available. The economics guys have been spending the last uh, year working out how to transform their data to make it available to their analysis routines. Uh, the political science people, we've started helping them sooner, but they're still really struggling with how you uh, reliably uh, download feeds of t millions of articles a day and then process the data. But what I find really exciting is the connections that start to uh, appear when you start thinking of this data as being in a single place. So here's a few. Um, looking at economics of development in Thailand, well that's in many ways tightly related to issues of environmental uh, mon modeling and uh, climate change. Uh, those in turn are related to issues of epidemiology. Uh, if you're trying to plan a malaria eradication program, then you're going to want to have information that these guys have got on uh, access to transportation, wealth, uh, distribution of hospitals and so forth. And you even may be interested in how articles about various uh, eradication schemes are recorded in the, reported in the press. So the political science news feeds start to become useful. Um, we have a, a big economics project that we're 
getting underway and, and part of the relating to climate change and one of the issues that people are interested in is how do you persuade people to uh, make environmentally sound choices so then the cognitive science work perhaps starts to come in as well but that's taking things just a little bit uh, uh, further. Um, second thing we've been doing over the last uh, few years is putting in place some very substantial hardware infrastructure or to say a few words about this. Um, so we, uh, this is a fun computer. Has anyone heard of a Psycortex system before? It's uh, based on a MIPS processor, uh, so it's got 1,000 chips, 6,000 cores, um, does about 6 terawatts per second. But the neat thing is that it only consumes 15 uh, kilowatts. So uh, it's a sort of a low, very small, low power system. This is a somewhat larger, medium power system, uh, the second fastest uh, uh, civilian supercomputer in the world, the IBM BGP. This is at Argon, yeah, this is at Argon also. Uh, we're also getting one for the Computation Institute at Chicago. Uh, we're using both of these for data intensive uh, computing. We've got access to remote systems like the TerraGrid. And then we have, uh, we're just in the midst of acquiring our own so called petascale active data store, which is intended to, it's our first attempt at building a system that can serve as this uh, cauldron, if you like, uh, the, you know, a, a framework for investigating some of these issues. So, of course, it could be more substantial, but this is what you get for a couple of million dollars. So it's got uh, about 500 terabytes of reliable storage, uh, a uh, compute cluster attached with a very high uh, I.O. bandwidth and, and uh, some built-in uh, GPUs, uh, multi-core system uh, for high-performance analysis. And then the goal is to put in place the, uh, the mechanisms that will allow us for dynamic provisioning of this uh, both data and computing, uh, parallel analysis routines, remote access mechanisms, uh, data real-time and, and staged data ingest mechanisms, and perhaps uh, start looking at how we might offload to remote data centers if they were, uh, were available. Yes, yeah, so that was a request from uh, some of the uh, biologists who are very concerned about having the backup. So, well, I mean, this is uh, this is a two raid, you know, two-way raid. Um, but of course, if that particular device is destroyed, then you've lost your data. So they want to be able to move things to a remote location. I'm just questioning yeah. whether tapes is the best yeah. medium. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, the there's a couple of reasons it's for great to yeah. Have a, yeah. No, I know. Yeah. It's about now you switch yeah, over right. tape to solid state. Yeah. Yeah, technology tape is always about to become the technology of the past. Um, is this an IBM system? Yeah, so it, well, that's interesting. So we've just got the money from NSF, and uh, IBM is our current uh, uh, vendor. So we haven't actually uh, signed any contracts, but uh, that's one. And this is a DDN system, and DDN Data Direct Networks. They are the vendor here, and uh, this is um, uh, you know it's a PC cluster. And uh, currently, IBM is the system integrator. Um, one more question about that slide. Yeah. Offload to remote data centers. Um, I mean, are we physically moving tapes, or are we sending it over a network? Or yeah, that's a good question. Um, whenever possible, we, we move uh, data uh, over networks because it's easier. But of course, one option is also to move uh, move racks, and that clearly has very high bandwidth. Project, you yeah. said that they generated enough data that it took three weeks to move it back over to the yeah. US. Uh, they were moving, yeah, that was, they were moving it uh, from Livermore to Chicago, and uh, it was only moving at 20 megabits per second. So it's. Uh, why isn't that? Why, yeah. out of curiosity, yeah. why don't they? You and I have had, had yeah. before FedEx 24 yeah. hour latency yeah. and capacity. Why wouldn't you put this stuff on tape or disk right. and ship it over next day? Yeah, it's a good question. Why didn't they do that? Um, probably it was. No one there was ready to mount it onto the disk. Maybe they didn't have the, the capabilities to do that. Yeah. Okay. But it's a, certainly in that case would have been a perfectly reasonable solution. I, I'm no uh, network bigot, as it were. Anyway, let's now go on and say a few words about some of the methods that we're, you know, we've been in various projects developing methods that uh, address various of the problems described in, in, in the, at the beginning of this talk. None of, the, none of these methods is uh, a complete, none of them is, either individually or in its entirety as a complete solution, but they do provide us some tools that have allowed us to uh, 
move forward in some useful way. So we've got work on HPC system software at Argon, which is, uh, I mean, Microsoft has supported some of the work on mPitch, um, parallel virtual file system. Uh, work I'll say a bit more about uh, on collaborative data tagging. Um, data integration work, which addresses this challenge of separating representation and, uh, and semantics of data. Uh, high performance data analytics and visualization. Uh, various tools, we work with Hadoop and we have our own system called Swift, which we think is better for expressing uh, what you might call loosely coupled uh, parallelism, particularly on data intensive applications. Dynamic provisioning mechanisms, service authoring tools, many of them developed in collaboration with the cancer biology community. Uh, provenance recording and query. We uh, have done a lot of work in service composition and workflow. We're working a lot now with the uh, Taverna system. Um, was that developed within the UK e-science program? Yep, so. yep, it's a great. We uh, have got the cancer biomedical informatics grid to adopt that as their, as their technology of choice. Uh, virtualization management and uh, distributed data management. And I'll say a few more about, a little bit about some of these uh, things, not, not too much. Yeah. Kepler and Taverna. Yeah. Uh, we spent a lot of time in the UK actually doing software engineering yeah. on the research tool yes. Taverna. And when I went to see Kepler, they complained that it was unfair. And they gave him an unfair advantage. Yeah. Because it was documented and worked. Yeah. The the CA Big people. Uh, this is the National Cancer Institute's Cancer Biomedical Informatics Grid. Are incredibly uh, careful and thorough in their evaluations. So I felt very pleased that they chose to use our Globus software for a lot of their work. But they also adopted Taverna after a many month evaluation process. So that was uh, very pleasing as well. Um, I'll say a few words. This is work that uh, Zarko Nesterov here has really been leading. Um, so I could even ask, but maybe I'll talk about it. So, um, so this is, uh, I put up this map here of Thailand because this is some of the data from uh, one of the Thai uh, surveys. And uh, if anyone has ever worked with social science data, this is very typical uh, uh, documentation, you've got some, this is a very rudimentary description of the data set. These are some of the variables. They have helpful names like RR7B um, or HC3. Uh, and if you go off and read up in a manual, you can find out that this is uh, a, uh, a representation of the, the name of the household uh, owner, I, I, I believe. Um, so a typical problem with social science data, and I think a lot of scientific data is it's impenetrable, relatively impenetrable to anyone but the expert. So we, we believe that collaborative tagging or tagging tools can be uh, used to allow individuals to start to uh, uh, basically tag, uh, document the paths that they follow through data, uh, perhaps uh, you know, identify the fields that they used in particular studies, maybe to annotate data with procedures that can be used to compute uh, new data products. Uh, and then if you allow these tags to be shared, then you get the collaborative or tagging or social networking uh, part of the, of the, uh, of the, of the system uh, where one individual working on a data set can from and learn from the experience so of others. This is different from microformats. Uh, yeah, I'm not a very deep, I don't have a deep understanding of microformats, but I think, yes, it's a, I mean, you might use more microformats, I think, to structure these tags. And you chose yeah. not to use semantic web ontologies and things like that. Right, so uh, as you probably know, there's a, a big argument that rages between the believers in structured and unstructured uh, um, uh, metadata or tags. Uh, I think that what we're doing is actually neutral with respect to that. In fact, we have people uh, at the university who want to start uh, uh, defining uh, ontologies that could be used to structure these tags uh, or alternatively to infer ontologies from the tags that are applied. Uh, I think that's sort of an independent uh, issue. But so tagging, of course, uh, in social networking are very familiar concepts. They're more often applied to photos and web pages. Here we're trying to apply them to structured scientific data. I think it's quite, uh, could lead to some very exciting uh, results. Certainly the people we describe it to, the scientists, uh, find it very, very uh, attractive. A second thing I'll just mention uh, addresses a problem that I was talking about with, uh, I think, uh, Jose just before the, the, the talk was the problem that uh, so much scientific data actually has this sort of structure. 
this is a typical, uh, if you look at a functional MRI data set, this is what you might see. So uh, uh, Yong Zhao here was uh, struggled with this problem for quite a while in his PhD thesis. So here you've got some, uh, if you have a bit of uh, inside knowledge, you know that uh, these uh, file names and directory names encode information about the structure of the data, and that the real structure looks like this. Uh, it's a nice, logical, hierarchically organized uh, collection of uh, MRI images with uh, runs that comprise of volumes that, uh, when aggregated, uh, describe a subject, and subjects form parts of groups, and groups form parts of studies, and so forth. Um, so what we've been doing with the XML data typing and mapping project is developing tools that allow you to map smoothly between these two views and then use an XML representation of the logical view to describe your analyses uh, with the appropriate operations happening on the physical world as, as needed. So you end up with these nice, uh, well, there's an XML representation, but this is the logical structure that you'll use to write your programs um, and under the covers, we're going to be reaching in and accessing data which may be stored in file systems, uh, in databases, uh, in, 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 other, in other forms. Um, and uh, I'll come back to that in a second um, when we talk about one of the tools that we've developed to perform uh, data analysis. Uh, so a, a common problem that we've encountered, and, and the, the, the Dryad group here I, I think is addressing a similar concerns, um, is that you know, people, could be individuals, groups, etc., come in and they want to perform uh, analyses on uh, these logically structured, hierarchically organized data sets. For example, they may want to take one of these studies and compare it with a second study, or they may want to uh, scale the members of one study uh, in order to uh, adapt it to a reference image and then see how uh, individuals' uh, brain function changes over time, for example, following recovery from a stroke, which is one study that we're currently uh, involved in. And that uh, involves, uh, can be sometimes literally millions of fairly comp complex computational tasks. One wants to be able to express that concisely, uh, map this onto uh, appro appropriate uh, computing resources and because we want, we're focused on process, feed the results back into our open analysis environment for further uh, analysis. And so the, uh, the SWIFT system that we've developed allows us to express uh, these sorts of analyses using nice high-level uh, functional uh, programming syntax. So here we, for example, have a procedure reorient run which we apply to a run and for each volume in the run we're going to apply a reorient uh, function. Um, you know, pretty straightforward stuff, but relative to uh, what's actually happening under the covers, people operating on files and complex directory structures, it's, it's quite uh, amazingly uh, simple. So this is the sort of thing that we're using in our own implementations of this open analysis environment. So, just you yeah. um, so there's some magic that happens. Yes. There because mapping from that into uh, What's actually taking place under the hood is is the is the key thing. Right. So, could you just say a little bit more about? Yeah. So the magic, that? which uh, much of which was implemented by Yong Zhao, uh, by the way, um, you know, was fairly uh, straightforward. So here you've uh, you're you're calling this reorient run function. You're passing in a uh, a pointer to uh, a run. Um, now this for each function, uh, for each volume uh, in in that. Uh, well, there's two runs being passed in, I guess. Uh, for each volume in that run, uh, well, that involves an operation to look at the underlying physical construct, which in this case is a directory, find out how many files in the directory and return a, a an XML structure representing the files in that directory. You're then going to invoke this, uh, this program, and it turns out this program via another little interface definition is a, uh, I think, a, probably a MATLAB program in this case. Uh, so uh, there'll be some logic to dispatch that computation to the appropriate place for the computation to occur, and this could be on a machine such as the Psycortex machine or our uh, or uh, the PADS uh, uh, cluster, um, and then eventually the results are either left there for further computation or gathered back uh, to some archival storage uh, for uh, to, to be to be stored. 
and so on and, and so forth. And, uh, well, yeah, the result is something like this, where each of these blue dots is a potentially uh, complex computation. I just have another. Oh, yeah, so we're, we're, we're tracking uh, provenance using uh, 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 this simple provenance uh, data model. Um, you know, so you've got uh, procedures the, that are called, and multiple pr procedure calls are linked together into workflows, and, and, uh, and workflows operate on data sets, and data sets uh, may have annotations, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's been quite a bit of work in building community consensus for, uh, uh, how to, for, for issues of how to record provenance. Roger uh, Baja was, uh, has been at various of these meetings, the International Provenance and uh, Annotation Workshops, which uh, we've been holding jointly with, again, the UK uh, uh, people. Um, I'll say just a few words about multi-level scheduling. This is sort of uh, interesting. So, you know, the you know, common, in our view, you know, it, it's not enough to simply make data available for people to query. We need to be able to allow people to compute on data. And uh, if you want to be able to compute on data, then you'll sometimes have very large amounts of computation to perform, um, particularly when you're performing into comparison. So we need to be able to uh, dynamically allocate resources for that computation to occur. And we've done a fair bit of work on building so you can ignore this faded out part, but this is sort of the runtime system for the SWIFT system. We dynamically allocate uh, execution nodes, virtual execution nodes, on a variety of different uh, computational platforms, Amazon EC2, Open Science Grid, TerraGrid, and more recently on our big uh, local uh, parallel computing uh, platforms. Yeah. Um, for the kind of applications that you're considering, how much of, of sort of uh, the smarts of what you need to do involve managing I.O. versus managing CPU? Of course, the answer is it depends. Um, and so I'd say in the, the early ones we've worked with, the smarts have in, focused on CPU, and increasingly now we're addressing problems that where the smarts involve uh, I.O. And we need to be either caching data or moving computation uh, to the data. Did that change happening because you, you sort of feel like you've addressed the things that are necessary with computation? Or do you see a trend uh, that's sort of pushing things in the direction of placing higher priorities on the consideration of I.O.? No, I think it's more that we feel we know how to address the computation, so now we can address a wider range of problems. Um, and this shows what happens when you run, this is a, this is a problem where I.O. is not a big concern. Each of these little dots is a task running on this uh, uh, 6,000 core Psycortex uh, machine. So uh, this, is a, this is a large parameter study using a, a molecular uh, dynamics code. Um, I'll say a few words also about uh, the issues of distributed data management. Uh, so this is a, you know, a typical use case uh, with, with, with which we work, where we data is being produced at a scientific observatory, in this case a gravitational wave observatory, uh, and we have, they, they, I guess they are not a big believer in sophisticated data management, so they simply replicate all of their data to all of the sites participating in this uh, experiment, and uh, which of course makes uh, data locality issues for analysis fairly straightforward. Um, and that means they are replicating about a terabyte of data per day to eight sites. Um, and uh, using some of the software that we've developed, they're able to do this with a lag time of uh, what ran about um, typically not more than an hour from when the data is initially uh, produced at the observatory. Now, clearly, data replication is only a, a partial solution, uh, but it's often a useful solution for making sure that the data you need to analyze is, is available where you need to analyze it. Um, so now I wanted to uh, take a few minutes and talk about a couple of applications before we wrap up here so, and, and show how we're applying these, uh, these methods uh, in, a, in, in various contexts. So the first one is a system called the Social Informatics Data Grid uh, developed by uh, uh, um, Bennett Berthen Berthenthal and his colleagues. Uh, at Chicago. He's now actually at Indiana University, but the development continues at Chicago and UIC. Uh, and uh, 
as you may guess from this picture, their interest is in enabling the modal, multi, multi, modal analysis of uh, cognitive science uh, data. So they've got people doing things uh, and they're filming them and videoing them and sometimes they'll be taking uh, various uh, you know, other sensor uh, data and of course they then want to compare them with other people, uh, other experiments and also analyze the data in various ways. And uh, historically this community has been incredibly bad at sharing data. So what the uh, SIGGRID system done, has done, uh, despite the name, it's really basically an open analysis environment. It's a system into which many people can pour their experimental data um, uh, in different forms, uh, into which we can register analysis programs, uh, mostly Swift scripts. Uh, we can associate metadata, and then using a variety of uh, platforms, many of them uh, both uh, web-based and other uh, client, uh, rich clients, we can browse data, search it, uh, we can preview content, we can transcode from one format to another, download it, uh, analyze it, and so forth. So in a sense, in a very discipline-specific way, it's an instantiation of an open uh, analysis uh, environment. Uh, and this apparently has been uh, very successful. They're starting to get a lot of data loaded up, and up into this, and you can look at it using web portal tools that lets you search things or uh, download things. Uh, Elan is a, a system uh, from, uh, I'm not sure where from, maybe Germany, for it's a rich client tool. Uh, this is a system uh, from uh, the UK called the, uh, what is it, the Digital Replay System, uh, which you can use to search and then grab data from this repository. Uh, and yeah, it's a, it's a very, Oh, I thought I might have had an example of a Swift script running, but it's a, as far as the average user is concerned, they have their nice traditional client tools, but it's reaching out over the network and accessing these very rich databases, which themselves are backed up by uh, the power of uh, high-performance parallel computers uh, as needed. Let me, uh, I'm going to mention a, one, more, one or two more examples. So this is a project that we're, uh, getting underway with some startup funding from Chicago and Argonne, and we're also talking to the MacArthur Foundation about it. The goal is here is to uh, address the challenges of socioeconomic and environmental modeling. Uh, we have a very grand title, the Community Integ Integrated Model for Economic and Resource Trajectories for Humankind, or Sim Earth. Uh, it's this, we have economists, environmental scientists, uh, numerical methods people, uh, geographers, etc., all in, involved in addressing this question. If you want to ask questions like, uh, okay, there's a shortage of food in, uh, in Africa. Is that due to biofuels uh, policies in the U.S.? So it's easy to say that it is, but it's not obvious one way or the other. If you want to be able to answer that question, you need to be able to gather data from many sources, uh, incorporate models of agriculture, transport, taxation, uh, policy, etc. Uh, put in place uh, state-of-the-art uh, economics methods that uh, address dynamics, uh, foresight, uncertainty, have high resolution, uh, and uh, put this in, pull these together uh, in order to, uh, well, answer that question. And what we believe, you know, that the community is ready for is, is a, uh, a sort of open platform uh, in which different people can contribute different component models and, and data in order to ask these questions. And I would say, that, you know, this is also potentially applicable to problems in areas like epidemiology uh, and development uh, economics. In fact, one of the early applications we're working with is in development economics. So this is uh, a picture I showed earlier. So this is uh, actually a, a model showing uh, predicted uh, levels of entrepreneurship, i.e. non-subsistence farming, in various parts of Thailand based on a very simple model that assumes that uh, development is only based on uh, your access to wealth, where wealth is determined by your sort of family uh, structure uh, and uh, previous occupation. And you can see there's a lot of uh, over, the red shows that we're predicting that entrepreneurship is occurring when it's not. So we're over predicting in this northeast part of the country. If we then uh, 
build a model that takes into account distance to major cities, uh, then you can see we do far better. Green shows that we're getting a, a pretty much perfect match. So this uh, you know, emphasizes that in order to study uh, these economic and development issues, we need uh, access to you know, real large amounts of geocoded uh, geo data and then the computational models that can uh, take this data and uh, perform um, those computations. So this is running on a you know, modest scale parallel computer. It's using data that was obtained from Thailand and manually transcoded. Uh, but uh, you know, we think we can automate a lot more of those processes. Uh, I'll say, I think I've got one last application. So this is maybe of interest to some of you. Uh, it relates to text mining. So this is a typical uh, biologist. Um, you know, there are literally certainly hundreds of thousands of biological articles produced every year. Uh, clearly no one reads them all. Um, uh, so how do we uh, make sense of, of, uh, of what is still in many cases the primary means of communicating scientific data? So ideally, of course, people would encode, encode their data in semantic web representations, but in practice they don't. They write a paper instead because that gets them uh, tenure or promotion. Um, so. Uh, there's a group at, uh, in the Computation Institute led by Andrei Rosetsky that's been building tools to uh, basically automate some of the knowledge extraction processes from this data. So uh, he has a system called Geneways, initially developed at Columbia before we hired him away from there. But it takes, uh, so far, biomedical articles. He's gone through about half a million at this point, I think. Uh, looks for you know, statements, uh, statements that of the form uh, you know, this uh, enzyme uh, catalyzes this reaction or this gene signals for this uh, and then uh, builds up um, putative uh, uh, networks, cellular networks, um, which basically capture what is the information, at least a subset of the information contained in those articles. Um, and uh, once you've done that, you can do all sorts of really wonderful things. So one thing you can do is combine this with uh, information uh, about uh, you know observed phenotypes, for example, uh, the uh, you, know, you, you might have uh, some of these one of these families that people have studied where you find out the uh, that certain people have certain diseases. Now, if, if you're looking at anything other than very simple single gene diseases, there isn't enough data to make uh, reasonable uh, uh, assignments of potential. Uh, you know, cause and effect to particular genes, but if you add in this reaction network uh, inform information, you can start to look for genes that are affect things in the same area of the, of the network and uh, use that. And, and they are getting some good results with, uh, for example, finding potential multi-gene causes uh, for breast cancer. You can also do other things. Um, you can take that data, uh, these vast collections of assertions of either belief or or fact, depending on how you view them, and then combine them with other information, for example, citation network information. So this is some citation network data obtained by another guy, and use that perhaps as another source of evidence regarding the uh, strength uh, of belief you may put into various statements. You know, if five people make one statement and one person makes another contradictory statement, you might believe that uh, that uh, the first statement is probably true and the second is not, but maybe you'll find out that the, the first five people all come from the same lab, in which case maybe you put less uh, belief in, in that statement. So there's lots of interesting things like that that we're working yeah, to is do. Is there a relationship between the algorithms that, that, that you've shown them in yeah. the consecutive slides? Is the relationship between Andre's algorithm and the algorithm? No, that no, shown that? Okay. Really, no quite right. different. But, but we are combining the where we've, with Andre, uh, James, and I uh, are working now to combine um, you know, some of this information with this information in, a use, in useful ways. Okay, so that was the, I just wanted to you know, show a bit more detail about uh, three applications, all of which involve lots of complex data and, and computed computation. You know, my, my belief is that, our belief is that you know, all three of these um, have a common need for what this open analytics environment, something that will allow us, will basically reduce the barriers to uh, putting data in, putting programs and rules in, mixing those together, matching what matches with what matches, 
match, watch, matching things together and then taking results out in a way that allows you to make sense of, of what happened um, and then addressing these other, uh, other concerns. Um, of course the challenge we face is that we've got various building blocks, we can buy uh, hardware, the hardware is uh, far from adequate and the building blocks we've got are certainly also far from adequate so uh, we'd be eager to work with people here on doing something like this on a, on a much larger uh, scale. And uh, you know, I'd say you know, my belief is that if uh, you know, lots of people are sort of sniffing around this, this problem of how you create community repositories for data that are more than just FTP sites. Uh, you know, Google, has an, I think, has announced or will announce plans to create a huge place where all the world's scientific data can be placed. There's uh, sites like Swivel which do that on a smaller uh, scale, but I think there is an opportunity to do something that uh, is, um, you know, overtakes the competition uh, in, in that way and really has a big impact. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. Yeah. Um, does the provenance data model work, uh, or is that tightly coupled with SWIFT? So does the action, the SWIFT naturally carry up some of the metadata that allows you to track the provenance? Yes, that's that's the idea. Um, uh, and I say th there's a slight hesitation there, just because in in an earlier version it was completely integrated. I think we've just finished reintegrating it into the latest version of the system. Yeah. But the data model was fairly. You know, neutral with respect to uh, the system that you're using to perform the computation, but the idea is, is and, the, and the reality is, uh, uh, j just recently that we now do generate such assertions uh, as computations perform, and and uh, that's actually got all sorts of interesting consequences. Um, as probably Roger could also tell you, you can start to you know reason about what computations have been performed and which have not. You can uh, you know talk about you know, how efficiently people are using the system, which data is popular and which is not, and, and so forth. Yeah? So, um, we're selling the, the, the dream of sharing all this data, yeah. and, and is, is the way to do that, is that through federation, or are we actually just putting the stuff so that everybody can access it and not really worrying about, you know, retaining access control or, or basically security privileges yeah. and stuff like that for different users. Yeah, no, well, there's quite a few questions mixed up there together. I know the, the Google guys, their plan is that you upload the data and it's got to be on a Creative Commons license that anyone can use. Um, and of course, there's a lot of data that has that property, um, but also a lot of data that does not. Uh, so I, I believe that access control does have to be uh, addressed and is important. Uh, secondly, you know, I think ultimately we have to be federating because, of course, there will be more than one data center in the world. At the same time, you know, an awful lot of people don't want to maintain their own data. I, I think you know, this cloud notion is very compelling to many people. Not Certainly to many it is not, but you know, if I look around the University of Chicago and, and Argonne, there are literally thousands of little databases, uh, mostly write-only, essentially, you know, Excel, Excel files, uh, floppy disks, tapes of various sorts. And uh, I think uh, also many people that have, where the you know, exponential growth has sort of crossed some threshold in terms of their ability to manage. And so I, I think uh, in that sense, centralization is a very powerful and uh, quite attractive uh, concept uh, for them. I mean, in some areas like the National Library of Medicine, David yeah. Littman believes that it's much better to have it all under his yeah. control. But I don't think that's fine for some subset of the literature, but I think that's a scalable model. Yeah. And even there, uh, well, the literature, you're right. So that even, I mean, the various well, biological... I, mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, even those databases, there are other people who grab that data and then perform their own curation um, of that data and their own annotation, perhaps automatically generated annotations regarding, you know, in, inferred function, or who perhaps, uh, you know, have different versions of the same uh, gene. And so, you know, I think there is a potentially a big uh, distributed truth maintenance problem trying to find out what's going on. That's an area also of, of interest uh, to, to us. At the Cyber Infrastructure Advisory Committee a couple yep. of weeks ago, Bruce Decaine and I got them to agree that, that they would advise the NSF they should have an open data and publication policy. Yeah. 
Oh, absolutely, they, they should. Right. One. Yes. And, uh, I don't know what will happen to that suggestion, yeah. but it's in the minutes and yeah. it's official. I mean, it's a great idea. Um, I think at the same time, it's, see, as long as there's a significant cost associated with publication, th then uh, people are going to be reluctant uh, to, to perform it. So we need to find ways of streamlining the, the process. Well, the other thing is also the cost of, of curating and annotating data. Yeah. I mean, Uniprot, for example, uh, I'm told is over 100 full-time curators. Yeah. yeah. I do wonder how much of that, perhaps I'm naive here, but how much of that we can a automate. Um, Right, I'm not sure. Yeah. I think we have to. Yeah. I'm not very familiar with the Swift programming model, but to what degree has Swift been able to um, basically unleash the power of parallelism? I mean, it seems that even though it looks like a lot of function yeah. calls, yep. uh, every function can itself be very procedural. And now yes. Very yeah, so it's, it's a. It addresses a very, I mean, it's curious, it's one, you know, it's not a, uh, I mean, it's really parallel logic programming in another, uh, another <laughs> in another guise, but, but it, no, it's, it's addressing a very, at least currently, and I mean, it's something very uh, simplistic, really, uh, making it, allowing people to coordinate the execution of many individual sequential programs. So they can be parallel programs that are coordinated, in some cases they are. Um, but it turns out that that's how many people do actually uh, think of, um, of the work that they need to do. Certainly many problems don't fit into that framework, but, but uh, especially in the, we find in the social sciences and biological sciences, a lot seem to have that, so that property. So how do you know, or how do I know whether yeah. my problem fits the model? Yeah. Uh, I think we'd find out in a few minutes if we sat down and talked about it. I mean, is it a more general model than Hadoop? Yes, it is because it has, uh, you know, Hadoop is, I mean, it has basically, you know, has, of course, map and reduce. Here we can uh, perform, we have map operations, but also more complex forms of uh, inter interaction. Yeah. So in source? Yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, I, I don't, I think, I can't remember if we tried running it on Windows, but it's all uh, written in, uh, in uh, Java, so it would run, yeah. So a lot of the problems, yeah. the environment that you yeah. presented is uh, this big part of yeah, right. It's a huge, super mainframe type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, has people, you know, are people looking at ways to extract subsets of that to work in? Right. No, I think that's got to. I mean, that's obviously got to be part of the the, the model. Um, you know, for example, in the the economics uh, people that we're working with, that you know, they're very interested in allowing. I mean, this is actually in a sense, you know, the, the current mode of working is your data is remotely and when you want to operate on it, you, you, you grab a subset. And, and of course, that's something that people want to do and they'll continue to want to do. But I think the more, this, to the extent we can start to push analysis uh, into the cloud, um, you know, I think we will empower uh, users because the, the sheer quantities of data that people want to operate on are too large for people to bring them, bring them locally. Another large project we, we are involved in is called the Earth System Grid, uh, which is, provides access to all of the intergovernmental panel on climate change data, which is several, I think, 100 terabytes or more. And you know, the current figure of merit that we have there is the amount of data that people download to their workstations for analysis. So, and that's running at a, a terabyte of, day, of, of data a day or so. But you know, in my view, ultimately, the goal should be that that number goes down, not up. Uh, because clearly it's, as climate model data set goes from you know, tens of terabytes to petabytes in size, it's no longer possible for people to Correct. But co I think collect it locally. Correct, but there are stages to the analysis of data, yeah. right? So when you are early yes. in the early phases where you are ingesting the data, right. yeah, you are talking about terabytes, yeah. you know, petabytes and more. Yeah. But then as people, Analysis start yes, no, finding facts yeah. and, and, yeah. and collapsing right. and grouping yeah. and aggregating the data. Right. That data is reduced and the quality yes. of the data increases. No, absolutely. So you know, it's given that the level where it yeah. makes sense to actually exactly. No, absolutely. And I think so. It need the ultimately you're interacting with these systems from your from your dis your desktop, right? And that should be uh, and that should be a rich interface, not a, not a not a simple interface. Yeah. Yeah. There's a commingling of 
economic issues, essentially yep. how do you pay for these issues, along with computation issues. Yes. I mean, usually when you say data curation, you just mean, oh, I'm going to store it somewhere and I'm going to make sure it's yep. I have a backup somewhere. That's not what I mean by curation. Yeah, I understand. Right. I understand. But I, I think part of the point that Jose is making is that you know we should consider part of the cost of data curation to be making sure there are enough compute resources close to the data, right. so that so that you can yeah. you can you know do function shipping basically yes. rather than data shipping. Yeah. And it becomes more of a query optimization. Because you know, otherwise the data is just put away somewhere to die and it's never uh, yeah. uh, accessed. And you know one uh, I think you know we're still many people are still a bit you know think in terms of data analysis as a person looking at data, but increasingly it's got to be programs looking at data. As Alex Soleil says, you know, the amount of data is increasing exponentially. The number of analysts is constant, more or less. So clearly each question uh, is going to involve an exponential amount of data in, unless you're, you're missing opportunities. But the pay forward yeah. aspect is actually pretty critical yeah. to all of this. Yeah. Because the question as to what degree, you know, how much in terms of compute resources yeah. as a as a relative to the actual storage of data, yeah. are people sort of willing to give you for free? Yeah. You know, along with the data versus, you know, I'm willing to pay, so you either make sure their compute resource is close to the data, or I pay for you to ship me tapes, you know, and I'll do it on my own, you know, resource. In so another, I know we, we need to wrap up, but another, you know, potential opportunity is there are, you know, there's uh, repeat, re people ask the same question repeatedly, and, and that, and that, I mean, certainly in an environmental, data, you know, climate data, what they do is they go through and compute some predefined set of commonly asked questions, you know, uh, seasonal means of sea surface temperature. And so if you want a seasonal mean, that's really easy to get. But if you want something slightly different, then you've got to download the whole data set. But maybe many people would like something different. Okay, I think okay. we better wrap yeah. up there. Thank you. Uh, and let's thank you again for yeah. the talk. And those of you who want to talk to him afterwards, I'm sure he's willing to yeah. Thanks very much. Great. Thanks.